Misery by Anton Chekhov Translated by Constance Garnett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Misery by Anton Chekhov To whom should I tell my grief? The twilight of evening. Big flakes of white snow are whirling lazily about the street lamps, which have just been lighted, and lying in a thin, soft layer of roofs, horses' backs, shoulders, caps. Iona Potapov, the sledge driver, is all white like a ghost. He sits on the box without stirring, bent as double as the living body can be bent. If a regular snowfall fell on him, it seems as though even then he would not think it necessary to shake it off. His little mare is white and motionless, too. Her stillness, the angularity of her lines, the stick-like straightness of her legs, make her look like a halfpenny gingerbread horse. She is probably lost in thought. Anyone who has been torn away from the plough, from the familiar grey landscapes, and cast into this slough, full of monstrous lights, of unceasing uproar and hurrying people, is bound to think. It is a long time since Iona and his nag have budged. They came out of the yard before dinner-time, and not a single fare yet. But now the shades of evening are falling on the town. The pale light of the street lamps changes to a vivid color, and the bustle of the streets grows noisier. Sledge to Viborgskaya, Iona hears. Sledge! Iona starts, and through his snow-plastered eyelashes sees an officer in a military overcoat, with a hood over his head. To Viborgskaya, repeats the officer. Are you asleep? To Viborgskaya! In token of assent, Iona gives a tug at the reins, which sends cakes of snow flying from the horse's back and shoulders. The officer gets into the sledge. The sledge-driver clicks to the horse, cranes his neck like a swan, rises in his seat, and more from habit than necessity, brandishes his whip. The mare crags her neck too, crooks her stick-like legs, and hesitatingly sets off. Where are you shoving, you devil? Iona immediately hears shouts from the dark mass shifting to and fro before him. Where the devil are you going? Keep to the right. You don't know how to drive. Keep to the right, says the officer angrily. A coachman driving a carriage swears at him. A pedestrian crossing the road and brushing the horse's nose with his shoulder looks at him angrily and shakes the snow off his sleeve. Iona fidgets on the box as though he were sitting on thorns, jerks his elbows, and turns his eyes about, like one possessed, as though he did not know where he was, or why he was there. "'What rascals they all are!' says the officer jocosely. "'They are simply doing their best to run up against you, or fall under the horse's feet. They must be doing it on purpose.' Iona looks at his fare and moves his lips. Apparently he means to say something, but nothing comes but a sniff. <sighs> what? inquires the officer. Iona gives a wry smile, and straining his throat, brings out huskily. My son, uh, my son died this week, sir. Hmm. What did he die of? Iona turns his whole body round to his fare and says, Who can tell? It must have been from fever. He lay three days in the hospital, and then he died. God's will. Turn round, you devil, comes out of the darkness. Have you gone cracked, you old dog? Look where you are going. Drive on, drive on, says the officer. We shan't get there till tomorrow going on like this. Hurry up! The sledge-driver cranes his neck again, 
rises in his seat, and with heavy grace swings his whip. Several times he looks round at the officer, but the latter keeps his eyes shut, and is apparently disinclined to listen. Putting his fare down at Viborgskaya, Iona stops by a restaurant, and again sits huddled up on the box. Again the wet snow paints him and his horse white. One hour passes, and then another. Three young men, two tall and thin, one short and hunchbacked, come up, railing at each other and loudly stamping on the pavement with their galoshes. Cabby! To the police bridge! The hunchback cries in a cracked voice. The three of us! Twenty kopecks! Iona tugs at the reins and clicks to his horse. Twenty kopecks is not a fair price, but he has no thoughts for that. Whether it is a rouble or whether it is five kopecks does not matter to him now, so long as he has a fare. The three young men, shoving each other and using bad language, go up to the sledge, and all three try to sit down at once. The question remains to be settled. Which are to sit down, and which one is to stand? After long altercation, ill-temper, and abuse, they come to the conclusion that the hunchback must stand, because he is the shortest. "'Well, drive on,' says the hunchback in his cracked voice, settling himself and breathing down Iona's neck. "'Cut along! What a cap you've got, my friend! You shouldn't find a worse one in all Petersburg!' <laughs> laughs Iona. It's nothing to boast of. Well, then, nothing to boast of. Drive on. Are you going to drive like this all the way, eh? Shall I give you one in the neck? My head aches, says one of the tall ones. At the Dukmasov's yesterday, Vaska and I drank four bottles of brandy between us. I can't make out why you talk such stuff, says the other tall one angrily. You'll lie like a brute. Strike me dead. It's the truth. It's about as true that a louse coughs. <laughs> Grins Iona. Merry, gentlemen. Tfu, the devil take you, cries the hunchback indignantly. Will you get on, you old plague, or won't you? Is that the way to drive? Give her one with a whip. Hang it all. Give it her well. Iona feels behind his back the jolting person and quivering voice of the hunchback. He hears abuse addressed to him, and the feeling of loneliness begins, little by little, to be less heavy on his heart. The hunchback swears at him till he chokes over some elaborately whimsical string of epithets, and is overpowered by his cough. His tall companions begins talking of a certain Nadezhda Petrovna. Iona looks round at them. Waiting until there is a brief pause, he looks round once again and says, uh, This week, er, uh, my, er, uh, son died. We shall all die, says the hunchback with a sigh, wiping his lips after coughing. Come! Drive on, drive on. My friends, I simply cannot stand crawling like this. When will he get us there? Well, you give him a little encouragement. One in the neck. Do you hear, old plague? I'll make you start. If one stands on ceremony with fellows like you, one may as well walk. Do you hear, you old dragon? Or don't you care a hag what we say? Iona hears, rather than feels, a slap at the back of his neck. He he! He laughs. Merry, gentlemen. God give you health. Cabman, are you married? asks one of the tall ones. Aye, he he! Merry, gentlemen. The only wife for me now is the damp earth. Hey ho ho! The grave, that is. Here's my dead son, and I am alive. It's a strange thing. Death has come in at the wrong door. 
instead of coming from me, it went from my son. Ionig turns round to tell them how his son died. But at that point the hunchback gives a faint sigh and announces that, thank God, they have arrived at last. After taking his twenty kopecks, Iona gazes for a long while after the revellers, who disappear into a dark entry. Again he is alone, and again there is silence for him. The misery, which has been for a brief space erased, comes back again, and tears his heart more cruelly than ever. With a look of anxiety and suffering, Iona's eyes stray restlessly among the crowds moving to and fro on both sides of the street. Can he not find among those thousands someone who will listen to him? But the crowds flit by, heedless of him and his misery. His misery is immense, beyond all bounds. If Iona's heart were to burst and his misery to flow out, it would flood the whole world, it seems. But yet it is not seen. It has found a hiding place in such an insignificant shell that one could not have found it with a candle by daylight. Iona sees a house porter with a parcel and makes up his mind to address him. What time will it be, friend? he asks. Going on for ten. Why have you stopped here? Drive on. Iona drives a few paces away, bends himself double and gives himself up to misery. He feels it is no good to appeal to people. But before five minutes have passed, he draws himself up, shakes his head as though he feels a sharp pain, and tugs at the reins. He can bear it no longer. Back to the yard, he thinks. To the yard! And this little mare, as though she knew his thoughts, falls to trotting. An hour and a half later, Iona is sitting by a big dirty stove. On the stove, on the floor, and on the benches are people snoring. The air is full of smells and stuffiness. Iona looks at the sleeping figures, scratches himself, and regrets that he has come home so early. I have not earned enough to pay for the oats, even, he thinks. That's why I am so miserable. A man who knows how to do his work, who has had enough to eat, and whose horse has had enough to eat, is always at ease. In one of the corners a young cabman gets up, clears his throat sleepily, and makes for the water bucket. Want a drink? Iona asks him. Seems so. May it do you good. But my son is dead, mate. Do you hear? A week in the hospital. It's a queer business. Iona looks to see the effect produced by his words, but he sees nothing. The young man has covered his head over and is already asleep. The old man sighs and scratches himself. Just as the young man had been thirsty for water, he thirsts for speech. His son will soon have been dead a week and he has not really talked to anybody yet. He wants to talk of it properly, with deliberation. He wants to tell how his son was taken ill, how he suffered, what he said before he died, how he died. He wants to describe the funeral and how he went to the hospital to get his son's clothes. He still has his daughter Anisia in the country, and he wants to talk about her, too. Yes, he has plenty to talk about now. His listener ought to sigh and exclaim and lament. It would be even better to talk to women, though they are silly creatures. They blubber at the first word. Let's go out and have a look at the mare, Iona thinks. There is always time for sleep. You'll have sleep enough, no fear. He puts on his coat and goes into the stables where his mare is standing. He thinks about oats, about hay, about the weather. He cannot think about his son when he is alone. To talk about him with someone is possible. But to think of him and picture him 
is insufferable anguish. "'Are you munching?' Iona asks his mare, seeing her shining eyes. "'There, munch away, munch away. Since we have not earned enough for oats, we will eat hay. Yes, I have grown too old to drive. My son ought to be driving, not I. He was a real cabman. He ought to have lived.' Iona is silent for a while, and then he goes on. That's how it is, old girl. Kuzma Ionich is gone. He said good-bye to me. He went and died, for no reason. Now s suppose you had a little colt, and you were own mother to that little colt, and all at once that same little colt went and died. You'd be sorry, wouldn't you? The little mare munches, listens, and breathes on her master's hands. Iona is carried away, and tells her all about it. End of Misery by Anton Chekhov This recording is in the public domain. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake